so we can uh, start the meeting at 6.32. Um, and first order of business is public comment. Uh, no members of the public in the room other than Senator Pertzik, who's going to participate in the discussion in just a few minutes. Uh, and looks like we have someone on the on Zoom. Uh, Amanda, you want to go ahead, please? data and also relied on qualitative data to carry our work for all of our kids. 
qualitative data is our stories as parents, and students is a big is a, is a big piece missing. I'm very nervous and shaking, so if you don't understand it, let me know, because my accent makes it triple. We need to do better not to pit teachers against parents. This is not about this. This is not why I'm here. Uh, Libby and I fundamentally disagree in her testimony against the dys dyslexia bill in 2020, where she states that the vast research showing that once a student is identified with a special need, they fall further and further behind the, their peers. This is not the first time that I, I have heard this. Um, I am not sure what the vast research is, but I can provide other research that shows that the advantages of identifying children with learning difference early is cheaper than later on when they need intervention and they can't really catch up. So for the past year, I have seen Henry's light get dimmer and his music within quieting down. He has come home crying. He calls himself stupid. He's seven years old. He was screaming in the bathtub that he hated himself every bit of him, okay? In a few occasions in his after-school program, he was called, repeated by other kids, big head with a small brains. His sister was there to defend him and probably the only reason why I found out. I'm not here about that, but I'm here because it's a systemic issue and we need to correlate it. Reading a struggling is also correlated with low self-esteem issues and he's feeling it. This is a systemic issue. Reading is an equity issue. Recent data shows that English language learners perform significantly worse than non-English language learners. And Blacks and American Indians or Alaska Natives perform significantly worse than white students and other racial groups. If you look at the data from the corrections department who house youth, and who are educated in our youth who ended up in the corrections department, they have extremely low literacy level. Here's a, here's a pipeline, and we need to do better. A special education audit is currently underway, and the only parent input was a survey. Not sure that is in affiliation. I have her, Libby, and her team working hard to make systems, but what about the kids that cannot wait for a system that is not ready? I know my kid can't wait, and I will give him what he needs, but others might not be able to. He's pro probably going to get him a tutor, and we're going to be. Somebody said that education here is a rich man's game. I don't know what that means, but it means that if you have the opportunity to get the resources that you need, you'll get it. And if you can't, you can. So I really hope that as a board, you have the conversation and help the state make decisions to give our kids what they need. This is not just about Henry, but about many kids in our district. There's a design principle that I really love that says, we view change as emergent from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process, rather than as a point in the end of process. I hope we use this principle in our district to work collaboratively with parents and with other experts that know. We are not here as part of some other institutions. We are here as parents getting the resources that they need. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Um, you appreciate the comments, very well stated. Um, any other public comment? Just I'm not. Hand. Just hand. I Hi, Jim. Grace Hassan. Oh, hey, Grace. Uh, hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Grace Hasden. I'm the parent of two children at UES. Uh, one is currently a fourth grader who is gifted and dyslexic, and the other is a first grader who is bright and neurotypical. Both of my students have also struggled to acquire early literacy skills while at UES. Um, and I'm sorry, this is emotional. Um, I've reached out to this board about these issues before. I'm here tonight because I'm worried that many children in our district aren't learning to read and write proficiently, not for lack of ability, not for lack of caring on the part of teachers, that's very clear to me, but because our district doesn't use an evidence-based structured literacy curriculum to teach foundational literacy skills. Um, as Amanda already 
you know, covered in some depth. Um, my understanding from conversations with Mike Berry, um, other instructors in the building, um, is that many, if not all, teachers at UES are using uh, Lucy Calkins units of study to teach reading and writing. And it espouses a balanced literacy approach, which encourages um, SMV, which is structure, meaning, visual system, and that's commonly referred to as three queuing, which has been um, shown by research to be an effect ineffective reading strategy that is utilized by poor readers to compensate for a lack of decoding skills. And decoding skills are what you get through structured, direct, explicit, um, systematic uh, phonics instruction. So in 2020, Student Achievement Partners, a nonprofit focused on improving student achievement, particularly for students facing barriers of racism and poverty, convened a panel of literacy experts to review units of study against the relevant research base, and they found it lacking in phonics and foundational skills building and supports for English language learners. Then in 2021, Units of Study was awarded a failing grade by Ed Reports, which is also an independent nonprofit that uses expert educators to review K-12 curricula against common core standards. Uh, finally, in 2021, Georgia Policy Labs issued a report of its study evaluating the impact of the Lucy Hawkins program in the elementary schools in the Metro Atlanta School District. And given the available data, they found no evidence that the Lucy Hawkins reading program had a positive effect on reading achievement gains in grades one, two, one through three. Um, I'm also happy to share um, all of those reports um, with the board after the meeting. Um, so are there students in our district who are succeeding in the current balanced literacy curriculum used in many of our district classrooms? Of course there are, um, but that's likely because they're part of the 40% or so learners that research shows are going to learn to read proficiently regardless of the instruction model. The evidence also tells us that the remaining 60 or so percent of students which includes learners with specific learning disabilities, but also a majority of typical learners, will only acquire reading proficiency through direct, explicit, and systematic structured literacy instruction. Both of my kids fall into that 60% category, one with a diagnosed learning disability and the other a bright typical learner. Both of them have struggled in their early academic career to acquire certain um, literacy skills and both of them have lacked access to consistent, evidence-based uh, structured literacy instruction in their classrooms. Um, and as Amanda also pretty eloquently mentioned, while my partner and I are privileged, middle-class, white professionals with all of the resources to pay out of pocket for learning evaluations and tutoring to meet our kids' needs, which we do because we love them and this stuff is hard, um, you know, we're worried about the kids who don't have those resources available to them, and those are the kids that are going to fall through the cracks. The heaviest burden is going to be borne by our BIPOC, English language learner, low income, learning disabled, and other marginalized students. And to the extent that this board cares about equity, which, you know, I personally know a lot of the folks on the board, and I think you do, this um, literacy education piece is a gaping black spot for the district, and I'm asking you to do something about it. So, um, I didn't think I was going to be this emotional um, <laughs> at this point in the speech, um, but the question I want to leave you with is, you know, why, why would we ignore the settled body of evidence and continue to invest in a balanced literacy curriculum that teaches 3 qa when we know, I mean, we've known for decades that nearly all students can and will learn to read proficiently with direct explicit structure for literacy instruction. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, any other comments? For some reason, I'm not seeing hands. Is that it? Or mm -hmm. was it? I didn't see mm -hmm. it. No, it's All right. Thank you for that. We, we definitely, that is a subject we're paying a lot of attention to. So we appreciate the, um, the feedback. Can I just request, that was, a, I very much appreciate both of you showing up, Amanda and Grace, and if you wouldn't mind emailing us what you shared tonight, just so that we can fully um, understand it, um, because it's a lot to take in just in hearing it. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, no, thank you for that, Mia.
Uh, uh, moving on to consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Um, do we have a second? I'll second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Consent agenda moves uh, or passes. Um, oh, I just close out the Zoom. Um, so next we're um, very fortunate to have several of our legislators here. Um, I think what we at Division is just kind of an open discussion. Also some introductions. I know there's some uh, new folks in the legislature representing Washington County and um, Montpelier Roxbury, uh, Montpelier and Roxbury, um, and also some new board members. So I'm thinking this is a quick introduction and then um, I'd like to see the time to uh, the legislators to let us know what, what they feel is of importance in terms of education, what's on their plates, what we should um, be paying attention to. And I think we've got a few questions about um, some things like the, the PCB study, uh, the equity weighting, um, our ballot, which we're going to pass later that we'd like to discuss and maybe a few other items. So um, let's, let's just start with the board. Uh, I'm Jim Murphy. I'm uh, the board chair. I've been on the board since I think 2016, if memory serves. Uh, and I live in Montpelier, uh, and I'm uh, an environmental lawyer with the National Wildlife Federation for my day job. Uh, Mia? Thanks, Jim. Hi, Andrew. Hi, everyone on the call. Um, I'm Mia Moore. I'm a Montpelier representative to the school board, and I'm also a parent of three kiddos in the district. And um, this is my, I think I'm going into my third year on the board. And um, yeah, my, in my, uh, my day job is um, doing coaching and consulting on, um, to help managers and teams um, work together in um, equitable and inclusive and collaborative ways. So I, kind of, I work for myself doing that. Hi, <clears throat> um, I'm Aniket Kulkarni. I've been on the board since 2020. So finishing up the third year. Um, I live in Montpelier as well, and I have, um, we have a daughter who's in the uh, high school. Uh, and as my, in my day job, I, ha I own a software development and consulting company. And so I've, I've enjoyed being on the board last three years, and I've learned a lot. Thank you. Um, Rhett Williams, I live in Roxbury. I have uh, two first graders and a senior in the district, and I work for the Department of Mental Health. Hi, Andrew. Kristen Gettler. Hi, Anne and Anne and Kate. Um, my name is Kristen Gettler. I am a resident of Roxbury. I have a second grader here at Roxbury Village School. Um, I serve on the Facilities and Energy Committee as well as the Equity Committee for our board. And uh, my day job is uh, I'm the assistant director for CDSU After School, and I co-manage our small family farm. Thanks for being here. Hi, I'm Lynn Turcott. Um, I'm representing Montpelier. This is my fourth board meeting, having been appointed um, to fill in a vacancy, so I'm on serious catch-up duty. Um, but I am planning to run and uh, try to be on for another three years. Um, I have an interest in boards and community service. I've been on a number of boards, and um, I'm a retired clinical psychologist. And um, I have two grandkids in the Montpelier school system, so I'm interested in, and I've worked in the schools, I'm interested in educational issues. Leah, I've got, of course, my most important biography which is I have three kids in the school, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, and I'm on, the, um, yeah. I'm on the equity and the I negotiations. <laughs> Uh, Libby? Oh, I'm Libby Boatsdale. I live in Jericho. <laughs> I'm the superintendent of schools. I'm Merrick Moden. I'm a student representative on the, on the, on the board since last February. Um, I'm Jill Remick. I'm a Montpelier resident, and um, I'm also the Montpelier Roxbury School Board representative on the Center Vermont Career Center Board. I also have a high school student um, in Montpelier, and I work at the tax department in my day job. 
two members on Zoom. Um, Seiji and Emma, do you want to introduce yourselves quickly? Yep, my name is Seiji Ohashi. I live in Montpelier. I'm coming up on one year on the school board. Um, I have two kiddos in the system, and um, I work for the Agency of Digital Services for the state. Hi, I'm Emma Bay Hansen, and I represent Montpelier. I have two kids in the school district, and um, I serve on policy committee and facilities and energy committee. And um, I was a teacher for a while, and now I'm working for Vermont Higher Education Collaborative, and we do professional development for so, teachers. Good opportunity to come to these small schools that we have in Vermont. I always enjoy it. I'm Andrew Perchlick. I represent the Washington Senate District, which is all of Washington County, plus Stowe, plus Orange, plus Braintree. Uh, this will be my third term. And the first two terms, I was on education, so spent a lot of time on education policy. Had the joy of talking to Superintendent Bonesteel very often in that committee. The literacy comments that we heard at the beginning, we talked a lot about that. Uh, really found that interesting, but had an opportunity to move to a different committee. So this year I'm on appropriations. I'm the vice chair of appropriations. And so we'll be looking at education issues from the kind of appropriations side, but still have an interest in, in education for sure. <laughs> it's an all new all, education Senate committee is all new except for the chair. Everybody is new, but there's some good people, including a, a teacher. Anne? Anne Watson? That doesn't narrow it. Yeah. I, either Anne. <laughs> yeah, there's two ends. I, I, I'll follow up from Andrew. Uh, I'm Senator Anne Cummings. I am the senior senator and one of the few returning seniors to the Senate. I chair finance, and for two years I did chair education. I live in Montpelier. I put four children through the Montpelier school system. Um, I, I've got grandkids in Vermont school systems, but the closest ones, I have two grandsons in Barrytown. But I do follow education as closely as I can. And my committee read it, um, is responsible for the education fund, read that property taxes. So mm -hmm. um, I do, and I see a lot of Jill Remick in her day job. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, my name is Ann Watson. I am the, the newest senator from uh, the Washington District. And uh, I just want you to know I am joined today by my little human, uh, Peter, who is uh, just, we have just finished dinner. And this is, this is actually why I'm not there in person right now. I'm on child care duty right now. So, um, but I'm, I'm psyched to be here. I know um, many of you already, as I am also a teacher in the districts that, in, in this district, I teach uh, physics and engineering and uh, math. And yeah, I um, am on the National Resources and Energy Committee. I am actually the uh, vice chair of that committee, and I'm also on government operations. And uh, I don't wanna get too far ahead, but we did just today, uh, vote out of committee uh, uh, a bill that uh, I, I think is going to be um, relevant to you all. So uh, happy to jump in about that when it's time. Okay, thanks, Anne. And uh, Kate. Yeah, I'm Kate, and I can relate to your newest board member who's been there. This is her fourth meeting. Um, this is my third week at the State House, so I am learning all the time. I am on the uh, House Ed Committee. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of testimony on um, public uh, property tax monies going to pay for independent schools. Um, and today we were talking with folks from the Principals Association and Superintendents Association and the AOE about the uh, workforce shortage. So I'm very concerned about uh, recruitment and retention of teachers in our schools. I have two um, daughters here in Montpelier. I do live in Montpelier. 
I have a daughter at Main Street Middle School in 8th grade, and then my oldest has just gone off to college this fall. Um, I'm a teacher also, like Ann Watson. I teach at U32 High School, and I teach math there. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, yeah, no, thank you, everyone. Um, I think we'll kind of, whoever wants to, you know, take the lead in terms of talking about some things that are on the plate, you know, again, I've raised a few issues that I think are on our mind. Obviously, you know, the waiting study implementation of that, which is going to have an impact on our bottom line. Um, uh, you know, the PCB uh, study, which we know is out there and has been a big issue in Burlington, and we have at least one building um, that was built in the kind of 50s, which we know was an era where there's definitely the potential for, for PCBs to be in the building. Um, two buildings and this building, okay. Um, and um, and then I'll, I'll just raise it now. You know, the, the way this has kind of come up during our conversation, because we have a, the budget we're passing, or we are gonna pass tonight most likely, uh, has about a 9.4% per pupil increase, but as you probably obviously know from being on the education committee, um, you know, with the, the crazy tax formula, it's, it's a modest tax increase for the Montpelier residents, I think about 1.3%, and it's actually a tax decrease for the Roxbury residents. But with the legislation as it's written, the way it appears on the ballot, it looks like it's a 9.4% increase. So, um, yeah, we have concerns, our business manager has concerns about just the way that appears uh, on the ballot unless, you know, unless the voter comes in educated about what all those numbers mean. It's, you know, there's a good chance that a, you know, a first time, a, a voter who's being introduced with the budget for the first time is going to see 9.4% and be like, wow. Um, so we just wanted to at least alert that as something the legislature might want to take up if it's not thinking about it already. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you unless there's others want to, um, you know, throw a question they know they want want answered before they start speaking. The waiting study is 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 I think going to be a huge transformational change to our education funding as it rolls out. We're just we're having rolled it. We're just in the first year. It's a five-year rollout, so we're not going to really see the impacts right away. I think you know that was by design. It gives the tax department everybody more time to to get used to it, and the towns to get used to that transition as as it happens. So there's not really anything to report on that other than still going forward, and we'll and we'll see. And I th I'm assuming you're getting better data than you did before when we were trying to figure out how it's going to impact everybody as your student body changes and you can look at the numbers um so there's nothing really there um i've heard issues around the ballot wording i seem to remember that there is some opportunities to write about what the tax increase is and so i don't know but but i, I agree with you if they just see the nine percent even though if other parts of the of the language to talk about the tax increase being not an issue that they might still vote against it and Happy to do that. That would be an, a, a good issue for government ops to, to address, I think. But the Education Committee could deal with it as well. I mean, the issue that I feel like was un, undone in my time in education was with facilities, which ties in. So it was a big part of the lead study that we did in all the schools that we thought was going to be horrible. And it turned out not to be as bad. We were able to change out a lot of the faucets and things that, without having major multi-million dollar projects, but then we want to move on to the PCBs, and that that could end up being, you know, more than than the schools can handle, like in Burlington. Hopefully, we don't have full school teardowns like that. That more of it will be like Cabot, where they find one building, and we'll see what all the remediation plan is at those smaller schools. It, it, it's still going to be more expensive than the schools can really handle. So today, had a, a meeting about like how are we going to fund these not only the pcb re remediation but all the other deferred maintenance that all our schools have basically you can't walk into a school without noticing this or that hasn't been taken care of to, because the school boards are trying to save money they don't want to have that huge tax raise on the on the ballot so 
and we haven't had school construction aid from the state for 12 years or whatever it is. So that discussion, we were getting a report in October. That's the assessment of all the schools. We had an inventory. And I really want to finish that work that, that I kind of started on the education committee about making sure that the state supports our schools and making sure we have functional buildings, have actual good air quality, whether it be for pathogens, but also just oxygen in the room is, is important, obviously, for learning. And we have a lot of classrooms in Vermont that don't have proper ventilation. And so ventilation, HVAC, plus everything else, is going to be hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and i don't want the state just to say oh that's too much money so working today on a plan for how we're going to address that so that's the main education thing that i'm trying to work on Looks like, um i don't know who on zoom wants to wants to start off to 
institutions, which does the bonding. And at that point, we were somewhere around 90, 100 million dollars we could bond for. We're now down to 60. Um, our bonding capacity has been significantly cut by the bond bank. We, um, so we're trying, but we do know that uh, we are going to have to find a way. Uh, we're waiting for that facility study to help schools cope with a lot of deferred maintenance. Um, you know, for all the deferred maintenance you may have, there are schools um, that a lot of people wouldn't send their dogs to, that we really have some significant just sanitation problems that need to be cleaned up and we know that if we don't find a way to fund it with other state funds, you're going to borrow bond for it and that pay, that cost is going to go into the end fund and everybody's going to share, but it's going to basically lose everybody's property taxes and I think none of us want to see that happen. So all I can tell you is we're working on it. But no easy fix. Great. Thank you, Senator Cummings. Um, Anna Kate? Um, yeah, happy to jump in here. So, uh, just today, uh, the uh, Senate Gov Ops Committee passed uh, H42 which is really an extension of the COVID provisions for an open meeting law. Uh, so it would uh, allow uh, municipal, municipality, uh, well, so legislative bodies uh, that are municipal as well as school boards to meet fully remotely if you uh, wanted to. Uh, so that's one um, aspect of it. But I think the um, uh, the most relevant piece is it suspends the requirement to uh, have specified language around uh, the uh, budget ballot item. And so um, I, I know there's, there's better requirements about the language for like how the budgets are um, phrased on the ballot. And my understanding is that with the um, changes to uh, the equalized uh, uh, people waiting, um, that language is going to change uh, in, 2020, in, the, in fiscal year 2025, uh, but we're not in fiscal year 2025. So um, this bill also sort of extends down to now um, the suspension of that requirement. So uh, there is no suggested uh, rephrasing of any ballot language. So it just, it just says, um, uh, the ballot language requirement is suspended during the years 2023 and 2024. Um, so I'm going to defer to uh, the other senators as to how the process goes from here, but I, it is now passed both the House and the Senate, and so I expect that to uh, pass out of uh, the, the Senate in general probably pretty soon. So you know, things got to have to be in 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 place by the 26th of January, so um, that was certainly motivational for us to get this done. Great, that is great to hear. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Now? If we vote on the ballot language tonight, and that, that what Ann just described, what Senator Watson, sorry, yeah. just described, won't really affect this year's. Uh, unless we language. make a motion that would give, say, Libby or Christina the ability to change that language if the legislation changes, which we could do. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should be my suggestion. Okay. Yeah, we took a look at that language today um, in the Finance Committee because it could impact small taxes or something if it influences how people vote. Um, we didn't have the bill, but we did have Secretary French in. I gather that the tax commissioner was in to the House committee. Uh, the administration 
opposes um, removing that language. They think that coming out of all the partner funds that people should be able to have some idea. Um, if they oppose it enough to veto it, nobody knows. But um, they, they were clear that they didn't think we should remove it. But we basically said we didn't think about it, yeah, that it had a whole lot of impact and didn't want to slow down the bill in any way. So left it up to the box. Yeah, we had that same testimony today as well. Um, and, you know, part of the thinking around that is, I guess that was originally a, a part of a, a, a couple of requirements that would have been potential cost containment. Uh, but we, at, we, we asked pretty directly, you know, did, did the administration feel that this was um, an effective cost containment measure? And he said, we don't think about it in, in that way. It was more about transparency um, rather than um, a, a cost containment mechanism. I really appreciate your, your work on that. Um, Kate, or do you have a question? Kate? As I uh, sent an email, still sort of too new to, to comment on the things you wanted to talk about tonight, I will say that um, as a teacher, I my priorities lie with recruitment and retention. Teachers, um, I think, uh, we heard today in testimony that there are over 1,400 positions that are unfilled in the state of Vermont. Um, and I'd like to see us move in the direction of um, fully staffing our schools uh, to start with. And I know um, that comes down to some really hard decisions that legislatures are going to have to make around housing and childcare. We're going to um, get folks to come from out of state. We're going to have to talk about uh, grow your own program so that we can move folks out of pair of um, jobs and maybe into classroom teaching um, and also work with our uh, higher ed folks. So um, there's that. And also as a, a taxpayer in Montpelier, um, I share the concerns of some of the folks on the board who um, are looking at, at possibly being uh, taxed out of our homes. And I'd like to see us do um, some, some real good work around uh, reforming how, how we pay for Schools. And if I may, um, just to put a bug in your ear, potentially loan forgiveness for special special educators in particular is what my <laughs> my main concern would be. But something from the legislative branch around loan forgiveness may go a long way as well. Yeah, that was suggested by the Association of uh, Principals, Jay Nichols, today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would I would second that. I, I, I think especially attracting teachers to the state, that's a um, that's an entry barrier for a lot of a lot of folks. Um, I think it would make it very attractive for especially younger or, or you know, newer teachers to um, to want to come here. Uh, well, thank you. Um, questions or comments uh, from the board? I have one more thing to add. Oh, go ahead. That's the income-based education funding discussion. Uh, Senator Cummings and I were on the study committee over the summer and fall to look at it. There's a report out that talk doesn't say whether we should do it or not, but it says if the legislature was to do it, here's how you would set it up. And there's definitely some 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 people that are interested in in exploring that further. And I'm 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 one of them. I don't know if we're going to do it this year or anything, but I I think it could really change the way homeowners think about the how the funding is made for their local schools and not so tied to their property and all this complicated it it still is going to be complicated but we're hoping to make it a little less complicated and less worried about the income and the value of your home not matching and being pushed out of your home for that reason yeah and not just that i think just general support for education I think with a with vermont having an aging population you do have a lot of people whose you know income is kind of more of a retirement income but you know they've had their house for 30 40 years it's way more valuable than when they bought it um, and they don't have kids in the school so they're not 
connected to the schools, and I know that you know uh, a lot of a lot of people without kids in the school still are strong supporters of the school, but it can be a little different when you don't have kids in the school and 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 you're you're being pinched in terms of how you feel about you know. That I know you like to rent out of the Marshfield. I've had conversations with people that I know are income sensitized, but they're still going to vote against the budget because they just they they just think it's going to affect their taxes. Like you know, so they're. I think that has a has a psycho a large psychological effect on people. Even with our in, our progressive nature that we have of the property tax, it still impacts it. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the people generally have high income have skills. Right. And I would also say that Kate gave the rep, uh, Kate gave the the. the data point of 1400 openings when I left education committee in May we only had a thousand open so we're, we're heading in the wrong direction and that's that's really uh, sad to hear with our districts and districts across the state my wife's a teacher in, in the Washington Central District and, and they're struggling with staffing um, yeah in Kate's district so. Representative McCann has oh Kate Thank you for noticing. Sure. She's, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, wish, I, I have two things to, to say. I think uh, we need to watch the fact that those numbers are going up, like uh, um, Senator Perkson said. That means that people are leaving during the school year, um, and, and that's, a, that's a real problem to, to keep an eye on. And I also, um, I need to, to hang up here and join another uh, meeting on public banking, but I just wanted to, to shout out to Mayor Cotto. Um, glad to see you on the board, kid. Thank you. Keep, keep up the good work. Great. Well, thank you. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. Um, Thanks for the invitation. Yes, and uh, good luck with your first term. Uh, other questions or comments? The first one is... We talked about that, but that since that wasn't part of the that committee's charge, we didn't put that in the study. But that is something that's being discussed in the state house on how to have second homes have a, because we just have the two residential and non-residential basically. So can we have a third category of second homes basically? And Senator Cummings, do you want to get in? No, I'm. Um, the the big question is if we go to income for education, what will that do to the general fund, which depends on the income tax, to fund everything else? Um, all the community-based services, uh, which are mental health services that I know the school really needs more of. So that's the part of it. It's, if we take it out, um, what happens? And then it's been made quite clear that the towns will fill up some of that not all of that property tax, um, you know, that you vacate. So we're, we've got a lot of questions there. I am anticipating that there will be a bill and that there will be some further refinement um, to second homes. We cannot differentiate between in-state and out-of-state. We have to tax everybody equally. Um, we're still waiting to see the impact on the child tax credit that we put in last year, the largest tax credit ever. Um, we're not sure what that, and along with several other tax credits we did, we're not sure what that will do to revenue. So um, we're working on that. We're working on child care. Um, again, child care, paid family leave, my job will be to figure out how to pay for it, um, and we haven't found a way to raise two to four hundred million dollars. Uh, it's a lot of money, so um, we're looking at all of it right now. I have no idea where it's going to end up. And to add to that is the universal meals. We, we passed it last year, but we only funded it for one year, so we didn't have a funding source. So that's 
the other sun tassels that are coming says ahead of hers. I assume that we, when we put money in to feed kids, that we were going to feed kids. Uh, I know people said it was just for one year, but you don't feed kids for a year and then tell them to go hungry. Um, I know there is a lot of concern. I know the cost to Montpelier that has, you know, a significant number of children that can afford to buy lunch, and whether or not, yeah. I just can't believe in this day in swipe cards, we can't find a way to let kids that can afford to pay, pay for lunch, and kids that can't, you know, get free lunch. Everybody has a swipe card and it goes through and nobody has or blue or green slips. Um, it would take some startup money, money, but um, that's one we're going to deal with, but I'm assuming that until we finally find another way to deal with it, that cost is remaining in the end and it will impact, it will impact schools because it will add to the uh, tax rate. Thank you. Um, there was a part, yeah, second yeah. part was referenced uh, in this discussion, but um, sort of the status of discussions about affordable quality child care, but also paired with the question of universal after school. Mm -hmm. I know that um, affordable child care is rare, especially in very rural areas like this. It's just not here. And I don't know if those are separate issues. The universal after school, is that tied up with affordable child care or is it is it a separate? I, I try to bring them together. I was on the uh, universal after school task force. I learned a lot about that and the need and the benefits of it. So I'm a big proponent of it. But I think often the child care is the, the talking about the infant to four year olds. But the after school can deal with adolescents. So I think sometimes it is separate. Like the, the report that we got today from the Rand Corporation that the legislature asked for deals with only that. The yeah. the I think it's going to be connected, and I think there's a connection to paid family leave or parental leave, because that, you know, that's what I think is, is a good way to provide care for infants that's the most expensive and the most difficult to find if a parent or a family member can stay home with that infant, and that's kind of solves part of that problem. The after school is significant, because Roxbury here is was connected to, in a very convoluted way that has to do with the merger, connected to um, wash our neighbors, Northfield and Williamstown, with their 21st century grant. Montpelier Roxbury doesn't qualify for the 21st century grant. That grant has been, is over. So next year we have to redesign after school here in Roxbury, which would add considerable money to our poor people expense for Roxbury if we were to continue a program like we have now using 21st century funds and local funds. So it's it's a considerable challenge. And we don't have, because we don't have a 21st century grant, we don't have the staffing. We don't have a after school staff, you know. So um, we have to create one for our, our school of 40 kids, which is which is tricky. And we wanted to take it out of all of the, out of the agent, not just have it go through the agency of education and through that program with, the, well, with all the federal rules, but to allow community after school programs or schools that aren't eligible for the, those federal funds to to get the money from the state for the after school program. There is, well, there should be money from the cannabis sales tax that goes to after school. I mean, that was part of the deal and that's something that the governor still supports. So we don't know exactly how much that money is gonna be. Definitely not the beginning, it's not gonna be very much and there's issues there, but I'm still gonna be advocating that that money stay for universal after school because it's, a good prevention tool, but also it's... And it's key in these rural areas, like yeah. Rhett, Rhett said, there's right. no childcare here. Yeah. And it's, it's huge. Like, a lot of folks can walk, can walk in Montpelier, but there's no way that you can walk in, a, in, a, in an area that's geographically as large as Roxbury. And, I, and there are a lot of places like that that are just, it's two yeah. miles and it's, you know, <laughs> 600 feet <laughs> vertical, you know, elevation change. So Both ways. Both ways. Yeah. Both Christic ways. makes money yeah. pulling people out of the mud, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Senator Cummings, did you want to get in? No, I was
was just let's just say um that there is a you know part of the cannabis deal is money goes to prevention a large part of that that is after school um no we need after school programs the we spent this afternoon um hearing from the rand corporation on the cost of child care and again it comes and comes and goes with how much you know what income level you subsidize up to what percentage of fam family income do you have families pay there's a lot of levers but um yeah, if once we subtract out the money that is presently in the system we only have about a 200 159 79 dollar deficit um so that's going to take you know they basically gave us a whole list of taxes we could ra raise um raising taxes is never a palatable uh thing thing to do but we're going to be working through that um we know child care is necessary is economically necessary um you know we also have a family leave bill but it is a full-blown full family bill where you know fathers mothers um everybody gets time off to stay with kids and gets time off day with um you know age relative relatives aging relatives or sick kids um it's a good thing but it costs a lot of money and I'm one of those that believes you have to keep saying things and eventually it takes hold. My son and his family live, we live in Canada. They have all of these things and they pay 52% of their income in tax taxes. Ah, that is an unpalatable number in the United States. No, we have, we have lost um, universal care because the numbers come in so high. Um, um, that we just have a very different attitude to taxation and so we keep trying to jerry rig ways to pay for programs um that that we um that we you know we uh we are struggling to find a way find a way for them we do not have a whole lot of rich people um and a small number number of them in actual dollar pay a huge amount of the actual state rev revenue um to have one of them move hurt a lot more than to have me move um so we're so we're all we're always trying to find that balance but the bills are are high um if we do everything everything the building bright futures child care bill is around Four hundred and some million dollars, and there he is. Peter has joined us. Just to remind, to remind us what this is all about. That's right. Well, and and I may need to duck out here soon because uh, it is bedtime for this little guy. And as I'm sure you're aware, consistency. Sleepy though. <laughs> I know, right? He's, he's ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> he's not. Not and, be <laughs> and I'm going to have to leave too. I actually have another another commitment at seven thirty. So. Well, we appreciate both of time your time input. This is super helpful and helpful, and, and uh, um, really appreciate you coming to speak with us. And this both informs us, and we look forward, uh, look forward yeah, to yeah, with you through the through the session. Um, and congratulations, everyone, on another term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be in touch. You know, all three of us would be happy to come by, come to any other meetings. I know you got a lot of work to do. Don't so get spent all the time on this kind of thing. But really appreciate the work. I know what it takes to be on these school boards, so I really appreciate the time that you put into to doing it. But anything that comes up, contact any one of us. We're working as a good team, three of us. So we can, we can, or each one of us, we can reach out to you. Would you be able to stick around? Sure.
Yeah. There's the that Amanda Garces, who spoke earlier, is on the um, ethnic studies committee. That's coming out with, you know, I don't know what the right word is. Right. Right. So we, yeah, we created that group that Amanda was the chair of, and so they worked on these recommendations, and then. AOE is going to put them into the new standards. That's my understanding. So it's kind of it's been a multi-year process. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about literacy. Uh, we heard a lot of parents, like you heard today, that were very upset about the way we're doing literacy. Uh, we heard from other people that had a different opinion. There's there's a, an interesting divergence on on that I was interest. I found surprising that there was a difference of opinion on how we should teach reading. I just figured we had figured that out by now. So that it's been an interesting discussion and because of some disagreement on on how the, the best way to, everybody agrees there was a problem. Like we have a low kind of test scores if you want to look at using that as a metric. But there wasn't a, a really clear path forward when I was on the committee of what we can do about it other than let's try, to, let's try harder. Um, we did put some money for it. I think we put some, some try to help some schools to have more, you know, paraeducators and literacy teachers. I think there was another name for them that I'm forgetting. Yeah. So we, we did put some effort into it, but I think it's an ongoing discussion. And I, I mean, Libby knows more about it than I do. So. <laughs> but, but in the current chair, Brian Campion is specifically interested in it, and he wants to work on it more and hear from more people. So if, if the school board or the superintendents or parents in the district, like if you work with parents there's, that want to come, then they're, they're open to having more of that discussion. And I'm sure the house, they, they did some of that. I don't know if they did the same amount. So you could talk to Kate and, and see if the, the house education committee is going to have the same level of, of discussions around literacy. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks for, thank for coming yes. out. Yes. Yeah, and drive yes. safe because it's getting slick out there. Yes. Um, it's right at freezing. It's the worst time. To yeah, drive. it's right. Yeah, it's, <laughs> right. It's, we're having like, I think, mud season instead of winter. Um, <laughs> End of Jan. Oh. Yeah, and yeah, the. Uh, We've already got like the, the ruts and the frozen ruts and it's a mess. Yeah. Um, uh, facilities committee update. I don't know who the facilities committee wants to give a good hand it to you, Kristen, but if you're not on point, I'm feel free to pass the baton. I'm happy to share, but um, I can kick us off in letting you know that the last two months of facilities and energy committee meetings have um, largely focused on uh, our net zero work and really um, kind of charting a way forward on that. Um, we spent some time looking at other district and supervisor union approaches to establishing net zero policies and resolutions like really around the country um, and seeing what other other folks have done um, and after kind of looking at a sampling uh, we decided to forge ahead and start writing a, uh, a net zero resolution for our district um, so that's currently in process um, our second draft of that should be coming out anytime and then uh, we'll be revising that and hoping to arrive at a another draft that we want to share out with a group of you know vested community members um, you know including our folks our very good friends now um, from the Montpelier Energy Advisory Council uh, Roxbury also has an energy coordinator um, the Montpelier High School Earth Group um, and then some other local and state folks in the energy sector basically pulling all these folks together this is our draft this is what we have so far we would love your feedback on it to arrive at something that um, feels solid. Um, and we're looking at doing, hopefully, you know, kind of routing that around to reviewers by mid-February with the idea of having something final that we could bring to the board for consideration and possibly approval in March. Um, so that's, that's been the, the big focus of uh, FME over the last 
two months. Um, I did have the chance to go to the Montpelier High School Earth Group meeting yesterday to just circle back with them. Um, they were, it was, I think, my first or second board meeting they presented to the board. So it was a year and a half later, two, almost two years, but it was really great to be able to circle back to them. And, and some of the same students that actually gave the presentation were at that meeting. So to honor that work and reconnect with them and show them that yes, we heard you and um, we are we are getting to work, you know, kind of explaining our process. It took some time for our committee to really find its way. And um, so they are also willing to serve as reviewers of our draft resolution. So they are going to be in the fold for that. And, um, and then I think after we get done with that, we'll kind of get back to you know refocusing on on what's next. Certainly, the PCB uh, issue is on the radar, and just continuing to try to get information about that. I was looking today at the state website that has kind of the calendar of the testing, and it looks like now we're this up. Yeah, I have a, I actually wrote a letter to go out to the community on our testing schedule. Okay, Those that will go out. It's, it's going through Andrew right now, so it will yeah. probably go out. By so Friday, it, Monday at the latest. So I think it was UES and NS, NS are up in the next quarter, essentially. Yeah, we right? actually asked the AOE to move our test dates up because okay. we have so much construction happening this summer. Yeah. And so we want to know before that starts so we can fold right. it into the construction if we need to, fold yep. in any remediation. Yep. So um, so we asked them to move it up, and they were like, sure. Okay. So. And how many, how many schools have been tested? Total in the state? Yeah. So far? Uh, I think it's maybe a third, It's a handful. A they're, they're behind. And what are, the, what are they finding? Um, I can only you tell know? you by anecdote. Okay. So know that. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. I know that, you know, Cabot and Twinfield was referenced. Cabot has found two spots. One wasn't as bad as they thought it was. And then, you know, so it's... It's all over the place a little bit. Okay. Um, there's a school down south. I can't remember the exact. It's not Brattleboro. It's Brattleboro area. You yeah, know, really kind of down south has other. Um, they found PCBs in that school that they're working through. Um, but I don't believe they had to shut down any rooms, or the rooms they found it in were not significant enough to influence schooling yeah. as much. So it doesn't sound like it. Yeah, on any school as bad as Burlington? Not yet. Okay. And, yeah. and the thing to know about Burlington, too, is that they were using different actionable levels okay. when Burlington, like that wasn't a state-guided mission, if you will, yeah. right? So there, and I don't understand it all with Burlington, but that it was a different level and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, so... Some people have gotten, you know, have done the testing and have gotten reports back right away. And I've heard from other superintendents that they were supposed to get their reports back and they haven't. And they're still waiting. And um, so they're in a wait and see mode. Okay. So I think it's, I think the state is doing its best to try to abide by the timelines and the expectations and requirements. And they're finding that they don't have enough people, like actual people who are trained in this area to yeah. do the work. Not that they... Yeah, I don't think it's a staffing issue. I think it's a we it's literally a don't yeah. have this specialty in our in our state. Um, so I haven't heard terror yet, but also I know the the biggest the schools have spots. not yeah have not been tested. You know how long it takes to do the testing? I'm sorry, Anna. You know how long it takes to do the testing on average? I mean, our our I think it's like days. Oh, it's not, okay. so it's not weeks. you know, no, 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 to get the testing back. Yeah, it's but weeks. the actual yeah. testing doesn't take that no. long. Just a couple, a few days or whatever. Mm -hmm. okay. And we're part of is in UES and MSMS because that's where the construction is going to start sooner? Or I can tell you because I just have that letter up. So we've got some projects in those schools. But I also know those are the schools that at least from the, built, the date of construction seem to be yeah. probably. Again, this letter is going to go out. Um, soon. soon. And it's really a form letter that the agency has given us. Uh, UES is February 27th through March 7th. MSMS is February 27th through March 7th. Yeah. RVS is... So it's like over our break, right? Yeah, that's during break. Jan RVS and MHS are next January okay. through March. So, yes, because those are the two buildings that 
the construction. That's yeah. what you asked me about. Do you understand it that one classroom could have a high test and the next classroom could not? And yes. that one classroom would be sealed and the next classroom would be utilized? Is that possible? Yes. Really? It's that specific? By spots? You really mean spots? Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't know if it was... You see, there's a bad spot and the whole school... And we've received... I don't understand it yet, and because I'm kind of choosing that, I will learn to understand it. Should I need to understand yeah, it? <laughs> um, however, it's it's based on occupancy. It's based on child occupancy versus adult occupancy, and it's based on number of hours they're in the space. Like there's all kinds of formulas that they go by, um, and basically they'll say this is your level, and then I have to look at, or we have to look at what kind of occupancy for how much time to figure and then make enough. a decision off of that. So you um, can make adjustments and still use spaces just differently, potentially. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. We, as superintendents, we've tried to argue that regardless of what the um, science tells us to do, if there's PCBs that are found at a higher actionable level in a classroom, yeah, well, it's not going to matter if it's a child or yeah, an adult. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. so... I didn't really understand why they spent a lot of time going through that, um, just because. But uh, we'll see what happens. I have a question for the facilities committee. Once the resolution, once we have the resolution around net zero, what are what's the purpose of it? What are we going to do with it? Yeah. So we've been we've been wrangling with that also. So um, similarly, actually, the city of Montpelier first started with a resolution that then kind of parlayed into a policy. So we're, again, we're learning and we're studying and we're looking at what other districts are doing such to, to kind of learn from them. But that's one thought is that from there we maybe develop a policy. Um, you know, within the resolution currently, you know, there's language uh, about developing uh, an action plan, asking our administration to develop an action plan based on kind of these goals that we're setting. Um, so from there, that might kind of work in concert with developing a policy. Um, but to be honest, we're like definitely finding our way. I mean, one thing that we're also talking about is the fact that we have this earmarked $50,000 um, from last spring. Um, and so trying to be really mindful about optimizing those taxpayer dollars and what those are best used for. You know, we had discussed, you know, does it make sense to hire a consultant to help develop this resolution? And we said no, because, you know, let's let's take a crack at it and see where we land and see if it's something that we can do in-house versus allocating 50K toward it. So we feel pretty good about, you know, taking on this piece, but we are trying to discern what's the best use of that funding to optimize this effort. So it's on our minds, but we just haven't figured out the best use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a board, we set aside the fifty thousand dollars, right? So it's, I guess, it's, we didn't make a decision how to spend it. Um, does would the committee make that decision how to spend it, or how how would that work? My sense is that maybe we would have a recommendation after work, the work that we've done, and really kind of digging into things, that we would have a recommendation to the board on how to best spend that once we've kind of walked that line. Um, Jill, Sagey, or Emma could certainly. Pipe in if you have a anything to add on that or a, a different opinion, but um, yeah, I think that's the way the process would work. Yeah. So, yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you for all the work. I mean, I, I'm really excited. The um, net zero work is moving forward. I know it's important to the board, and it's important to the students, and it's important to the planet. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, the next uh, board action, which is to approve our proposed budget and warning, um, and given what we heard from uh, our legislators, it sounds like we might want to amend the language a little bit or at least give the administration the ability to amend the, the budget language in case something happens between now and the end of the month, uh, which um, given that the Scott administration seems to oppose it, I'm less sanguine than I was before I heard that. Uh, um, is there anything, just before I do that, is there anything, any changes to the budget that you want to report between now what we saw 
on the third. Two weeks ago. Yep. Christina is here. She's here virtually, so I'll let Christina chime in. She, you do have the tax rate calculation slide, um, just that part of our former budget presentation. So, Christina, do you want to jump in with any piece here? Hi, everyone. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm also on child care duty tonight. <laughs> Um, so the only change since the last time I met with you is that equalized pupils went up by 0.41. So that's what you're seeing here. Everything else will stay the same. Okay. And it's a 9.05% um, increase in ed spending per pupil. So that's what you're going to see in the ballot language. Unless they change it for us. Yeah. Yeah, at a 1.4% tax increase. So we're going to have to get that word out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, for anyone who might be reporting it out, that's 1.37% um, tax increase. Um, and a decrease for Roxbury. And a decrease of. 9.59. Yeah, 9 point, um, almost 9.6% for Roxbury. So, um, yeah, 1.3%. 7% increase for Montpelier, which I think is one of the lowest we've had, um, and a 9.59% decrease for residents of Rockbury. So, Are you um, going to plan on writing an op-ed? We will write an op-ed, um, and we will um, get that out as well, too, and I can... I was just going to say, I think after we vote, we could have a short discussion about what other things we can do, yeah. Outreach yeah. tactics we could employ. Um, I think the op-ed. Um, any other updates on the, the budget? No? No, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, any questions? What is the, is there an average um, tax increase around the state for school districts like where do we fall in that range i think we would be low maybe but do you mean the tax rate or do you mean the per pupil increase um i was thinking tax rate but christina have you heard from business managers the average around this year um well about a month ago we looked at the tax rates from last year and we were pretty average so what was our tax rate last year? I have to look it up. Christina, do you remember our tax rate from last year? I can look it up real quick. It's yeah, on I can get this it. It's on website. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't much last year either. Well, and then the, actually, it's in that second column. If you can share oh. your screen. Oh, wait. We have three years of data in that spreadsheet. Oh, yeah, I didn't pay attention to that. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> There's a lot of information on here, so. Mm -hmm. The educational tax rate was a dollar sixty-seven in Montpelier and a dollar forty-four in Roxbury. It was a deep. It was a deep decrease in Montpelier last year. And Roxbury. But overall, when, as we were asking, like statewide, we were pretty average. Okay. Yeah, I think it's also worth mentioning that, that this budget has some one-time expenses that are not going to carry over yes. to next year. Yes, it does. Um, I said this budget has some one-time expenses that are not going to carry over yeah, I to next that. next budget. So, um, you know, that, that per pupil increase is, you know, is much of that is not you know, costs that are going to transfer to, what is it, 23, is next year, 24, FY 25. 24? Oh, God. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like time traveling, writing these budgets. <laughs> uh, um, any, any other questions or comments? Otherwise, I think I'm going to entertain a motion to... Uh, well, let's, let's do it in two steps. Let's approve the budget and then approve the warning. I think we want to get some... Order. So, do I have a motion to approve the FY24 budget? So moved. Uh, discussion? <laughs> yep. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Uh, and sort of, we had eye on the phone. I definitely heard an eye from Seiji. Emma, do you want to vote? Did you vote? Aye. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, she's not there. You called her out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Totally the vote on the budget. <laughs> um, uh, great, congratulations all. Um, we have passed a budget now. Um, well, let's let's do the the uh, let's do the warning, and then we can have a couple minutes to talk about how we want to um, uh, talk to the voters about the budget. Um, do I have a motion to approve the warning? And I would suggest we approve the warning with a. Um, the ability for the administration to change the language, and I forget which article it is, Article is it 4 maybe? Art article 3. Article 3. Article 3. If there's a legislative change that allows for... That to happen. Yeah. For, a, a, for different numbers to be used. Um, Warning of the 2023 annual meeting, um, ballot language, um, and authorize our administration to amend Article 3 in the event the current legislation to um, remove the restrictions on language does in fact pass before our ballots are printed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have a second? Uh, any discussion? So I have a question because the numbers like the um, two cent increase are reliant on information we that is not solid yet so how do we avoid essentially over promising something to the voters if we were to say don't worry this is only a two cent increase but then the cla comes in different or the dollar yield because the dollar yield isn't we can't so every year that's a chance that's a right but but we haven't had language in the ballot that has been about the tax about taxes do you know what i'm saying but that would how you would edit? I guess I would like to know what we mean by edit the language. I think we would say like it projected. Because mm -hmm. even the okay. equalized pupil number, right? The, uh, or the, that the percentage, change. that that, could that, change that, that could change too because we are uh, in negotiations, right? So we have made some um, uh, assumptions. Oh, that, even what's written here, 9.05 yeah, yeah, higher. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it's a never, projection. Oh, it's always, okay. It's, yeah, never it's always a solid it's, number. It's not, never a solid okay. number. Yeah. Okay. And I... Can I ask a question? Um, I heard that the, there may be some uh, reservation about removing it um, from the administration. In that case, would they would we add to it, saying that okay, well, this is the language, but in addition to that, the, you know. I don't the, think we can. I, don't, I, don't I think, think the law change unless the law changes. I don't think we have the ability to to. to yeah, I guess that. my question was like, did I hear that right? That they may say that well you got to keep this but you can tack on some other things i don't think i think i don't think that's what the legis i think the legislation that the governor is will be given assuming he's giving it is going to say basically that there's not a language a specific language requirement for 23 24 until they have a new language requirement and if he just vetoes that bill then the existing law stays so and and i i think the chance of of the administration going back and negotiating something with the legislature and it passing by the 26th is, is as, about as close to zero as, as you can get. Mm -hmm. okay. Jill? As, as Senator Watson said, it's, it's part of a bill that also allows for remote meetings. So if we actually did need to come back together in the worst case scenario, we could hold a remote special meeting, warn it, so that those of us who were a quorum could then approve the new ballot language. Worst case scenario. Great. 
Um, any other questions or comments? So if it is a law, are we thinking that we would want to remove the per equalized pupil percentage, that percent higher, or would we want to, like it would be our preference. We, we could decide, if there's no, requ no language requirement, we could decide either to remove that or to, as Annika was saying, add a language, had a sentence that is, that is a projected tax increase or decrease, or, oh, I see Christina's raising her hand. <laughs> yeah, Christina, I mean, my, my preference would be to have more information rather than less, so to keep, right. to keep, keep that add. there and add and okay. a projected tax increase okay. of 1.37% for monthly or and yep. a decrease of, what is it, 9.59 for yep. Roxbury. Christina? Um, I would just say that I'd have to see if they're going to propose a new language or if they're going to let us decide what language we put in the ballot. So that's to be determined. I haven't seen anything. I know that they're trying to change it, but I don't know if they're going to give us other language or if we get to make it up. Gotcha. So, so the, the bill as it's written right now, H42, simply says it suspends the language that's required. So it says, 16 VSA 56 subsection 11D, which requires a school board to use specified language for a school budget ballot. The ballot language requirement is suspended during the years 2023 and 2024. Yeah, that's what I am. So, okay, we get to make it up. So we get to make it up. And our, our, I don't think we need to put this in the motion, our suggestion to the administration, if that passes, is that they add a sentence about the tax implications and leave the number about per That's what I would agree. Yeah. Huh? Do we need to amend the motion? Because I thought the motion I, was giving I, them the authority. I think we can keep the motion as it is, and the board has kind of spoken on it, and you know, we can we can scold Libby badly if you follow the it. The board has made yeah. their wishes clear. <laughs> yeah, the board has made its wish clear. So, um, School <laughs> Yeah, we can draft the language. Yeah. That's what the special meeting would be. A <laughs> school, public school thing. Yeah. Okay. Public shaming. <laughs> uh, uh, all those in favor? Uh, aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. Um, So we are on to policy monitoring. Uh, so we have two uh, uh, policy monitoring reports to approve. Uh, one is D08, alcohol and drug-free workplace, and the other is D11, alcohol, uh, drug and alcohol testing, which I think just applies to our transportation. Um, pretty much. Which is pretty much done by our bus STA, company. yeah. STA, yeah. yeah. Um, are we going to talk about plans for plans? Oh, yes. Oh, gosh, well, you know what? Since we're there, let's just approve these, and then we'll talk about plans. But thank you for... I suggested and then forgot. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Um, uh, I think these are pretty pretty easy monitoring reports. Do I have a motion to approve the monitoring reports? Uh, I move to approve um, the monitoring reports for policies D8 and D11. Do I have a second? Thanks, Lynn. Uh, any discussion or questions about the reports? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? All right, now we can talk about... Um, so I will definitely do an op-ed, and I welcome help on that. I mean, we could do... We could, we could do a... I could do it jointly with... Um, someone from Roxbury. Mia, you and I could do it as chair or vice chair. Um, one thing we might want to do is, is maybe we could do two op-eds, one for the bridge and one for the Times Argus. I don't think either paper will take an op-ed that's been published elsewhere, so it might be nice mm. for, say, Kristen and me to, to do Times Argus and maybe Rhett and Mia to do the bridge so it gets both places. Um, once it's out there, uh, I am happy to circulate it on, like, French Port Forum and um, and Facebook. I also think everybody here, as long as we don't get a conversation going, can can do a quick social media post on the budget. Uh, you know, we get into trouble when 
Rhett does a media post and then Kristen comments on it and then Joel comments on it. But if you just do one and then like let it sit, um, that's great. Uh, can we use? We're doing the podcast. We're doing with Jim we're and doing Kristen. The, yeah, oh, we're doing a podcast, which is also something that we can circulate share on social, social share media. on yeah. social media. Um, those are kind of some immediate ways, and um, uh, yeah, I'll open up the floor to other ideas. But but that's kind of what we have in the cooker, and I, I think doing two op eds, one for the bridge and one for the Times Argus, um, would be good. And we can um, how about. Chris, why don't we do one and, sure. and Rhett and Mia, do you want to do another? And, sure. Um, yeah, perfect. Uh, that we're, you know, because I think sometimes budgets are just, these kind of budgets are over, overwhelming for people. Yeah. It's so much money, and um, I think it's really good to try to be clear about our focus and direction and why things are the way they are. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't hesitate in that, you know, to kind of to that point to also just email your own sort of circle of people. Um, one of the things I'm remembering is when Jody presented the um, Career Center budget, the, our voters are going to see these two, these two items on the ballot. It will look confusing that the Career Center is listed differently but it's actually included in this number that we just approved, and that feels like a piece of information that will be really valuable just as like human to human to be cl clarifying that. Not only the fact that this, is a, this budget is an investment in our students and in our staff and in the education in the district. Those, I, so I would really encourage folks to, even if it was just to take the Times Argus you know, op-ed that Jim and Kristen are gonna write, put the link in an email and say, hey, everybody, I just want to encourage you to vote yes on the budget. Here, here's some, you know, read this if you want, but so please we, vote yes. We cannot ask people to vote yes. You can ask people to vote. We can ask okay. people to vote, and we can educate them on why it's a great budget, but we cannot Thank ask you. them to vote yes. That's very good clarification. Yes. Yeah. Okay, make sure you yes. vote. And I support the budget? You can say that. Okay. You can say that you support the budget, but okay. you can't say please vote yes on the budget. Okay. Yeah. Good. You That's can say the board unanimously approved uh -huh. this budget. Uh huh. And here's why I here's why I support it as a uh -huh. board member. Um. And and here's what it does. Okay. But you can't say please vote yes. Okay. You can say please vote. As as every. That feels like a very important clarification. I appreciate yes. you saying that. Um. And. So don't say vote yes, but I, I think sending a personal email to your circle, your network, and with information and saying, please make sure to vote on the budget um, would be really helpful. And I think the same is true in a slightly different sense for Front Porch Forum or the, the Facebook um, group page that it needs to show up in you know more than once. Oh, and absolutely. I think maybe kind of with increasing frequency leading up to town meeting day. Um, so I just would encourage all of us to, like, don't hold back. You know, um, maybe each of us says, we, we for sure will at least each post twice or something. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's no danger of getting into, a, um, like, commenting on someone's thing in front porch forum necessarily. But yes, make sure not to engage in conversation so that we don't break open meeting law. But I would say, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, just yeah. Get it out there. Send it out, and and you can always start a new link if you if you want to. Yeah. Avoid. Um, uh, I mean, one other thing. I mean, if if folks have time for it, um, you know, if, if there are a couple places where we could go and talk, I know we've done the senior center in the past. Anybody's. Usually we get the admin over at the senior center, yeah. which is a super fun thing for the admin to do. I can contact Tina to see if I can set that up. Yeah, um, and and that's that's kind of the other place we've, we've gotten is with crowd. Uh, oh yeah, they they like they yeah. like it. Yeah. Um, but if, if there's other places uh, either in Roxbury or Montpelier that you think you know you could gather an audience. Um, you know, just just leave me in, but feel free to reach out and ask. You, can, you know, come and talk. 
and answer questions. <clears throat> the uh, community um, volunteer group called Roxbury Roots, and we're hosting um, monthly potlucks. So that's on Sunday. So that's another venue for us to reach a bunch of people. So this year, we've made some decisions that we are very proud of. And there's been some misunderstanding about what it, how the budget is structured and, and what's included and what's not. Do we try to, is, would an op-ed be a good place or a bad place to get into that? It feels like a slippery slope of more misunderstanding. I don't know. I think a well-written op-ed can line out kind of how this plugs into, you know, the broader district values and goals and how we're making, you know, key and responsible investments around that. Rhett's asking specifically of, does it include the track? conversation about the track because oh, this yeah. budget does not include the track so to make that a clear statement yeah. and anything that's yes. written to the community I, I i had that in mind too and i thought that's what you're getting at i i think we can i think we can articulate that yeah it, it might be it might also be good to make that distinction that that track money is not part of the budget yeah right because there are there is some misunderstanding mm -hmm. yeah. that this budget includes track yeah, so I, I think that's worth. That's worth. I think mentioning. it's. I think it's worth mentioning because I think there's some confusion around there. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to offer to you know just be at Capitol Grounds once or twice between now and then if people wanted to swing by and ask questions or whatever. So. If you'd like me to join you, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Thanks. I will coordinate. Mm -hmm. If I can join the role as well, but um. I like, nice evening sitting out in front of Randy's store. <laughs> <laughs> Even on a night like tonight? Day, Sometimes. Yeah. It depends. You know, two hours. You know, got to hit the right window. <laughs> so I, th I think we've got a I think we've got a plan, and you know, as, as Mia said, recirculate. Um, you know, and as we get closer to uh, town, meeting town meeting day, I think everything we've got, you know, pop it up to the top of the of the social media thing so people have it. What's the thinking around time within terms of profits? Is it like two weeks before town meeting? So, What's uh, an ideal? I mean, if you and I can get a draft done in like two weeks, I think even like maybe like mid February, because uh, a lot of people vote early, and also I mean the other thing too is that's is a month away. yeah it's a month away. Okay. Um, remember that town meeting day falls on um, on the winter break, and this was actually this was actually the the one time during my tenure in Montpelier where the budget failed. One of the reasons it failed was because a lot of people left for that break. A lot of kids, you know, a lot of people with school aged kids, and said, Budget always passes in Montpelier. I you know, didn't have time to vote. I'm in wherever on the set, you know, on the seventh, you know, came back and was like, Oh my God. Like, it, so. So you know, people oftentimes will vote before they leave, um, and then and then I think also you know, urging people to vote and, and reminding people that they can can vote early. So, yeah. and then then you know we can always recirculate that stuff, um, you know, in a few days before the meeting. But. Great. Any anything else on, on that? And it sounds like we've got got a plan. Uh, uh, and thanks that everyone was the for the bridge for Red and Me. Yeah, the bridge. Okay. And then I don't know if Richard Shear still does his. He's not doing it this year. So he's running for mayor. Okay, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's unfortunate.
Huh? It's unfortunate. Yes. <laughs> uh, is, is there a, a Richard Shear stand-in? At... I don't think so, no. I think no. that that is only Richard's show. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it's, that's, that's what I was suspecting. But, um, uh, so I think we're on to, unless there's anything more of that, uh, I think we're on a fourth reading of a 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. And I don't know if Emma's, Emma's still with us. Um, I think we've incorporated. I'm still here, Jim, but I would prefer you to sort of walk through. Um, and then I can type in if I need to. Okay. Um, I think we've addressed most of the changes, and I need to get the things up. Most of the changes that have um, that were requested. Um, are there any questions about the changes? And I'm not, it looks like they're just linked. Okay. Yes, Lynn? Um, on uh, A22, I just need to know what this means. I know it's a legal thing, but I don't, I don't actually know the implications of it. Under policy, the last sentence, it says, nothing herein shall create a private right of action. What does that actually mean? So, um, that language, I think, is that language is in there because there are, you know, there there are state and federal rights of action for, um, you know, actions that are discriminatory. Uh, you know, we're putting in things that may arguably beyond be beyond what the district would be liable for under state and federal law. So we are trying to make clear. Um, and, and I think the risk is pretty low because if you don't have a statute to bring it under, you have a statute to bring it under. But um, that anything we're going kind of beyond what we normally would be liable for is not creating an actionable item. And then the only other thing I have is on A23. Yes. In the second paragraph, um, the second sentence, I think you've put. Um, moves the district forward twice in there by mistake, unless I'm reading it wrong. Um, where was I? I um, um, the second paragraph, the second sentence. It is, it is struck out in the um, line, yeah. line item or whatever. Okay, I didn't have a struck out yep. version. Yep. Your, yes, yep. what you're pointing out has been corrected. Okay, great. I had a couple yeah. just comments. On A23. Okay, let me see if I Okay. I have more just questions, which maybe the board may say, yeah, that looks fine in the policy language. And then I think a different conversation has to happen of timing and when and that kind of stuff. So it may be just a thing to point yeah. out that is work for the board to do or a conversation for the board. Down at the bottom under implementation where it says the board will assure that there are resources devoted to implementing the goals and will receive monitoring reports on a quarterly basis to ensure effective implementation of strategic plan. Um, Ooh, we should strike out strategic plan. Did you strike the strategic plan? I think strategic that plan was supposed, supposed to be goals. It's supposed to be goals. So some of my questions there, are they board-made goals? Are they district-made goals? Are they both? And then the other word that stuck out to me was quarterly because we aren't in session for, if you think of a year, yeah. or are we thinking of a school year, right? So a full school year, that would be every three months quarterly, which makes sense, but if we're talking about a school year, there won't be much data to report out on for one quarter. Yep. <laughs> so is that the correct language? Um, and if you divide a school year into quarters, then it's, it's almost... That's too much. Yeah, it's almost every third board meeting. Or yeah. Anakin's looking at me smiling because he knows math on the top of my head is not my strength. But <laughs> Anakin, I'm sure, can do that math for uh, me. <laughs> well, definitely strategic plan should be goals. And then whose goals? Um, I mean, in terms of quarterly, I'm less concerned because one quarter might be we're out of session and don't have any report. 
Okay. Oh, just as long as that's okay. Yeah. I just don't want to be yeah. in non-compliance with the policy yeah. because um, of that. Does that make sense? I'll just say, as an individual board member, the way I read it was for the calendar year, not the school yeah, year. Yeah, that's how I read it, too. And I think that that could still be the case. Like, it would still make sense to me if we had a meeting in, I don't know, the beginning of August or something for us to still be getting some kind of readout. I, you know, even if, this, even if school's not in session, I think is all I'm saying. I think it would just need to be clarified as to what that is. Yeah. Okay. Right? What's the data you're looking for uh -huh. there? You know what I mean? Um, and then uh, I just want to make sure the board. Yeah, it goes to plan there twice. Okay. So yeah, that, that paragraph needs cleaning up. Okay. Then that last sentence on a yearly basis, uh -huh. the board will revisit the vision and strategic plan, evaluate and make adjustments according to input from the community and the superintendent. Like that's a big commitment for the board every year to relook at a vision. And. Is that the commitment the board wants to make? Like, it makes sense to revisit yeah. goals every year. Of course, that makes sense. But uh, the vision, would we, would the board change that every year would be my question. That's a good point. I, yeah. I, again, just as a solo board member, I, would, I read that as revisit the vision to compare to how we're doing, like, assess progress. But I, think, but I think your point is well made, and we should probably just clarify that language yeah if that's I mean, what we mean yeah and, and I was kind of taking it as as that can be a are we okay with, with our current vision do we need an update this year right. everyone's okay with it okay done or like this is a year where we really think the vision is starting I see. to drift away uh -huh. from where we want the, the district to go and we do need a process so, so if it's that simple yeah then that's fine yeah. <laughs> But if it's I don't doing want like a visioning I don't want, process every year, right? I don't want yeah, the no, board to set themselves up for something that they can't commit yeah. to. I mean, I kind of I kind of took it, and I think we could clarify that, and there's clearly some other cleanup in that language we need to do. Um, I mean, I take that as a just a quick check in, like you know, so that way, you know, five years doesn't go by and people look at the vision and be like, why do we have that? Um, so so we can kind of just keep a you know, a temperature check of whether we still feel the vision matches where we, we want the vision to be. And if, and if it doesn't, or if it starts to drift, we get out ahead of that early rather than, you know, you know. No, I think it's easy to write. It's not easy to write a vision, vision, but once you have a vision, it's easy to say, oh, okay, we've got the vision statement done, right? And then, but I think being forced in a way to look at it once yeah. a year you know what I mean I, I think it just kind of keeps it in the face forward position and helps us think are there adjustments here we want to make because if we just said we do it every five years sometimes a lot happens in five years sometimes not a lot happens but yeah. <laughs> you know it's not recent history yeah. <laughs> a lot of okay, okay so we'll, we'll clean clean up that paragraph for We'll have a fifth reading. Fifth um, reading us. And set a record of these. Uh, and then the only other thing that I had on A24. A24, okay. In the purple part. Okay. The purple part. I think we should just color code all our. The policies. superintendent must ensure the board is adequately informed of the requirements duties. Just two and three significant challenges and significant student staff organizational accomplishments. Those terms are slightly subjective. And okay. so what I consider significant challenges may not be what the board considers significant challenges and vice yep. versa. Um, and so I think either that just deserves a lot of communication between myself or whoever's sitting in my seat and the board or um, some no. potentially more objective language. No. But I don't know how, I have no recommendation for what that language could be, but no. it's just, I wanted to point that out. Yeah. And just. Well, you can tell me which sentence you're talking about again. Yeah, number two and three, Emma, in the purple part on A24. The, it, so, so the part that I add. Oh, oh I yeah. The, the part name. that's a cut and paste from our current policies. From the current policy. Yeah. Yeah. Provide information on significant challenges, the plan for addressing them, and results. Provide information on significant student staff and organizational accomplishments. That means just not the, insignificant. <laughs> Just the word significant is subjective, as well as challenges, potentially. What I just did 
has significance. If it's, there's no metric, it's up to you. I mean, you're going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you're going to be honest with challenges that you want the board to be aware of. Yeah. And I would hope that other superintendents would do the same. It's, it could be that you just take the adjective out. That might be sufficient. I don't know if that's, yeah. Lynch, it's kind of your judgment. And we hope that you're, you know, we expect that you will be honest, I guess. I don't know if that's. Yeah, I mean, I, I read significant as kind of giving you a bit of latitude to because if we just say challenges, then like technically you need to tell us like everything. Like, <laughs> Jim's really, like, I really, know your job, Liv. It was just really hard to get out of bed this morning. <laughs> just want to report that. <laughs> Jim's like, I meet with you weekly, Libby. There's a lot of challenges. <laughs> uh huh. I can see what you mean. Yeah, I can see what you mean. Yeah. Something just to think about. Okay. I think I think with with lots of communication we can we can get through that. Yeah. I just wanted to point it out. Thanks for taking notes, Emma. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean the way I read it is that like if there's something, you know, a major bad thing or a major good thing, you're gonna work to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. COVID. Sorry, in H23, just about that Libby brought up, you know, the on a yearly basis. Do we feel like in that uh, in that policy, I mean, we're sort of consistently, or we're saying that we'll kind of consistently be checking back, you know, with the vision, but that we should articulate, like every three years, we will take like a substantive look at, you know, the vision and strategic plan to like ensure it still feels current, relevant, and responsive to current conditions such that, you know, we are just, you know, with a critical eye and with a process really kind of revisit. It's one thing, I guess, like revisit, I guess I just mean like, are we saying enough in there that like, this is our kind, these are our guiding principles and then do we need to carve out something where we say every three years we are going to like reevaluate and actually have a process? You mean write that out? I mean, yes. I, I'm personally, I think as long as, and I think Lynn made a good point, as long as we keep it thick, facing forward and look at it every year, that makes sense. I kind of feel like going through a major process on a timed basis could be in some cases a waste of resources because you know, there, there are things that, you know, I mean, like, like the merger was a place where, you know, revisit made sense, um, you know, you know, a major administrative change, some, you know, big substantive change in the law, um, change in the demographics of our community. I mean, these are all things that could, like, precipitate that, whereas, like, you know, going through a visioning process every three years just because we have it in policy, there, there might be a third year where it just, it makes absolutely no sense. And then, so we couldn't get a place where, like, you know, we, we have to do it on the third year because we have to do it, and then the next year, you know, some legislative bill forces up to merge with, you know, another district, and then all of a sudden we've got to do it again. And I guess I'm not saying that you launch like a whole visioning yeah. process community-wide. Like, I get that that is, it's a huge endeavor and certainly has a cost associated it, with it, but um, just more, so, I don't know, just the idea of just looking at it and reading it is, is, is one thing, obviously, but then to, you know, take a, just a, a a critical eye to it is is another but as long as like within here it's like we are circling back to this this is consistently kind of guiding our actions and guiding our strategies to to me i i took it as the the, the circling back has an action item of hey we need to have a visioning process because we're drifting way uh, away from it at some point so in that check annual you know yearly check third year or fourth year or second year, we may decide, yeah, we need to have a visioning process. Yeah. So that's, to me, that's how it came. I mean, yeah. I don't know if we want to add that as a, as a line in there, that one of the action items of that would be to know if we need another visioning process or not. But I don't think that's necessary, mm -hmm. um, as long as we all agree that that's check, check up is going to have that action item mm -hmm. as part of it. 
are we coming up on year three of this particular visioning process anyway? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, uh, point taken. Uh, how, do, how do people feel about that? Are they comfortable with, with this language maybe adjusted a little? Um, or do you feel any more? Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments on this? Sounds like we'll have one more reading and then or one more just for this one. Just for A23? And A24? I mean, I, I kind of feel since so they replace A1, A01 through A03, we should just move them all along and do it all at once so that we don't have... Because oh, yeah, otherwise, random. I think there's this weird... If we approve a few of them and not all of them, I think there's a question of... The conflicting ooh, policies. Yeah, what's, what's in place and what's not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we'll just bring them back for one more reading. Yeah. Because okay. we're not, I mean, we're not lost in the wilderness without, without these people. Okay. Here. We're lost in the wilderness for perhaps other reasons, but not this one. Um, so, I think, any other thing on these four pol five policies? Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Thanks, everyone.